Welcome to the Dole Institute of Politics. My name is Serena Peter and I am a member of the Dole Institute Student Advisory Board, the official student group of the Institute. The Student Advisory Board is a bipartisan group whose members can access many great opportunities through their involvement with the Institute, including volunteering at programs and networking with our special guests. If you are a student and would like to join, please contact us by emailing dolesab at ku.edu or speaking with a student worker after the program. After the presentation, we will have some time for the audience to ask questions. If you have a question, please raise your hand and a student worker with a microphone will come to you. Please stand if you are able and ask just one brief question. If you have difficulty hearing during the program, please alert one of our staff members or student volunteers who will assist you. Before we begin, I'd like to remind you to please turn off your cell phones. And now, please join me in welcoming our Associate Director, Dr. Barbara Ballard. Thank you, Serena. It is always a pleasure for us to have our students do our welcome. Again, I will say good evening and welcome to the Dole Institute of Politics and part two of this year's presidential lecture series, 1 to 44, the best and the worst of American presidents. This event is the second in a four-part series. We hope you will join us for the third and the fourth installments of the series on March the 12th and March the 14th. Both of those programs will be held at 7 p.m. Tonight's interview will be conducted by the Dole Institute of Politics Director, Bill Lacey. Today's guest has a long-standing relationship to the Dole Institute. In addition to serving as the Institute's first permanent director, he has delivered many outstanding lectures on presidential history and politics. He has served as director for a host of renowned institutions, including the presidential libraries of Herbert Hoover, Dwight D. Eisenhower, Ronald Reagan, Gerald R. Ford, and Abraham Lincoln. He is a frequent contributor to outlets such as Time, the New York Times, C-SPAN, and the PBS NewsHour. He has also served as a member of the academic advisory team for the C-SPAN Presidential Historians Survey, which will serve as a backdrop to this series. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome one of the nations foremost, and I said last night, foremost, <laughs> presidential scholars. And if we were in Allen Fieldhouse, and I wanted to say it, they would say Richard <laughs> Norton <laughs> Smith. <laughs> That's pretty good, Barbara. Can you do that every time from now on? <laughs> Richard, welcome back. Uh, we had a lot of fun Sunday. How many of you were here Sunday? Oh wow. My. Look Glut at that. Gluttons for punishment. Yes, I guess so. <laughs> uh, let's start tonight. Tonight we're talking about successful presidents. Let's start by letting me ask you, what are the accomplishments or metrics that are used in determining whether a president has been successful or not? Well, yeah, well there are a lot of that are conventional and predictable. Uh, we talked a little bit about it on Sunday. I'll certainly, uh, the the performance of the economy, uh, president's uh, record in terms of foreign relations, um, his relations with Congress. Um, more recently, uh, some surveys, like the C-SPAN survey, have added um, elements like uh, the pursuit of justice, however defined, but uh, uh, something that again sets the modern presidency apart from uh, from its uh, uh, antecedents. And all of those, all of those makes perfect sense. I actually approach um, the issue with a few, perhaps, less obvious attributes that I think contribute to the success or failure of a president. The first thing is character counts, and that sounds like a like a bromide, um, and not everyone can define obviously what character means. But one way of defining what character means is the willingness to sacrifice short-term political advantage um, for the long-term good of the country, in effect. And I'll give you an example. Um, when the Berlin Wall came down, <coughs> uh, everyone in the Bush White House, George H.W. Bush White House, 
uh, wanted the president to uh, take advantage of the moment and to uh, get the photo op of the, of the year, if not the decade, in front of the wall coming down. And after all, this was the, this was a victory celebration, in effect, after half a century um, of steadfast, purposeful, bipartisan uh, leadership in the Cold War. So it was, you know, it was a big occasion. Um, and Bush wouldn't do it. And he wouldn't do it for reasons that tell you a whole lot about a self-denying quality, a perspective, I would say, uh, in Bush 41. He wasn't interested in, as he said, rubbing Gorbachev's nose in the obvious failure of, of communism. But there's also a very practical reason. Uh, if you remember, this was uh, about the time of the uh, Iraqi invasion of Kuwait. We were trying to put together a global coalition, and we certainly didn't want the Russians actively opposing whatever that coalition was doing. And so it was a combination of gentlemanly decency and strategic calculation. But the result was the same. And, um, you know, character is measured, as I say, in a number of ways. I think it may sound odd to say that if you sacrifice your innermost convictions, that that's a, a test of leadership. But sometimes it happens. I mentioned the other day Thomas Jefferson buying Louisiana. Richard Nixon, who was the most fervent of anti-communists, um, threw all that overboard because he concluded that it was in the long-range interest of the United States and of China to end the isolation of uh, however many hundreds of millions of people then living in the People's Republic. Um, or more recently, um, actually when Bill Clinton really stood up to elements within his own party, most obviously um, labor unions, who were more powerful then than they are now, but certainly within the Democratic Party, a very significant uh, component of support and embraced NAFTA. And again, whatever you think of NAFTA, uh, the fact is it, political guts, okay? I think that's, uh, that's what I'm talking about when I, when I talk about character. Or, or the second George Bush, more recently, something that all of us lived through, when the economy basically collapsed and we were threatened with, in effect, the second Great Depression, as uh, the whole banking system was about to go over the abyss, something called TARP was created, and it was the most unpopular. It failed, first time, remember, the House, the House voted it down and the market went down 600 points or something in a day, and they got the message. And, and, and needless to say, TARP, which basically meant that the federal government would step in with the in, in, invaluable assistance of the Federal Reserve that was going to print money. Um, but the federal government would, would step in uh, and make good, if you will, the, uh, the debts of these mismanaged, in many ways, financial institutions. And it went against everything that Bush believed as a free marketeer. But he was able to look beyond, if you will, his lifelong convictions because the, the job and uh, the situation, which was unique, um, posed that test of presidential leadership. Uh, and the interesting thing is, if you still, uh, if you go out and ask people on the street, uh, I, I'm sure you'll get a, a hefty majority of people who philosophically object to TARP, notwithstanding the fact that it, it probably saved us. I mean, we, so we had a great recession instead of a great depression. But I guarantee you, you know, Bush doesn't get any credit. Now, that's one of the different, we talked about the other day, why it takes time to form perspective and, um, and, and, and maybe that will change a little bit. A couple of the quick things. I think a president needs a sense of history. Absolutely. You know, when Harry Truman fired Douglas MacArthur, he thought of George McClellan and Abraham Lincoln. I mean, Truman was very sensitive about the fact that he, he actually, I believe he's the only American 
president in the 20th century that did not have a college degree. And it's not that he didn't want to go to college, but it's that his family couldn't afford to send him. And, uh, and he compensated for that by being um, a, 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 you know, an enormous fan of history. He read voraciously all his life, especially history and biography. And he had this, you know, this really powerful, almost defining sense of history so that um, when, when, when a situation came to him, uh, certainly uh, the MacArthur firing is a good example, um, he could find a precedent for what he was going to do. The other thing I think clearly for their mental health, which is vital to all of us, presidents need is a sense of humor. Um, and, and, and by I, I mean the ability to laugh at oneself and the, uh, the more ridiculous aspects of Washington and, and, and political ambition, um, which, which on the face of it implies perspective and a kind of robust mental health. Um, I like to tell the story, Grover Cleveland, um, who was also known as President Vito, he, he vetoed more bills than all the presidents before him. And uh, that, you can imagine, did not do much for his popularity on Capitol Hill. And a true story, one night uh, he, uh, he and his young bride were fast asleep and um, Mrs. Cleveland was woken by sounds, uh, to her frightening sounds, in the White House and she sort of pushed her husband aside, woke him up groggily and, uh, and said, Grover, there are thieves in the house. And he said, no, my dear, thieves in the Senate, <laughs> not, not in the house. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, a sense of humor will get you through a whole lot of adversity. Um, and finally, and the, and the most important, maybe the most obvious, but it gets overlooked, the presidency is first and foremost the most political job in the world. William Howard Taft and Herbert Hoover are two men, uh, great men in many ways, with remarkable records of accomplishment. Um, Hoover fed a billion people in 55 countries. Um, he uh, reorganized the executive branch of government twice, one for Trump, once for Truman, once for Eisenhower. I mean, just on and on and on. Um, of course, in the popular mind, he's associated with the Great Depression. But he'd never run for office before he was elected. He'd been a businessman, and of course, the man who fed Belgium, and then the head of the Food Administration under Woodrow Wilson, and Warren Harding, Secretary of Commerce. These were appointed positions in recognition of his accomplishments. He hated, he hated politics. He just, he didn't have the gene. Um, William Howard Taft was very explicit. Taft was a judicial, you know, Taft belonged to the bench. And eventually, after four unhappy years in the White House, he, he got his wish when Warren Harding made him Chief Justice. And he said at one point, I forgot that I ever was president. And he lost, we all have seen the pictures of President Taft, my double, um, and, uh, but he lost uh, 100 pounds. So maybe, maybe I need to go on the Supreme Court. Um, <laughs> but in any event, he, uh, he, he was a huge success in every single thing he ever did except the presidency. So if you don't have um, a kind of gut instinct for politics, however you define that, if you don't enjoy the game, you may very well be miserable, and the odds are you're not going to be successful. Now, people will say, well, what about generals? They're not politicians. I would I would give generals are some of the best politicians, mm -hmm. you know? Certainly Dwight Eisenhower uh, proved that to be. George Washington, who insisted that because the country needed a non-political, non-partisan, unifying figure, because it had nothing else to bond it at that point. Washington went out of his way uh, to insist that he was no politician at all. 
And that was part of his genius as a politician. Mm -hmm. He made people believe it. One of your uh, observations on Sunday, which I found fascinating, and what was the fact that the presidency is far more complex post mass communications than before that. So I went back and I looked at the C-SPAN rankings and I found it fascinating that the top third, which is 14, half of them came before the widespread use of radio and then half of them came starting with FDR. I was just curious, what made those seven what they did so important and so well, successful that they yeah. still are on that top third of the list? In a short uh, uh, phrase, I'd say crisis management. Uh, the fact of the matter is um, Theodore Roosevelt, who, as you know, finished fourth in the survey, um, TR almost regretted the fact that there was no war during his presidency, that um, you know, it, it, he didn't have the opportunity to, to demonstrate, you know, his full medal, and um, he, 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 he made up for it in personal combativeness. He had his own war with Congress from time to time and, uh, and, and other elements of the, of the body politic, but um, he, he, he was enough of a historian to know that it's wartime presidents who, in effect, have a shortcut to Mount Rushmore uh, depending upon how the war goes. Um, James Madison managed to sort of stumble uh, his way uh, to uh, non-defeat in the War of 1812, which, which basically meant a victory. A tie goes to the Americans. And, and with that, American independence was once and for all established. Now, it's, it's fascinating. It just goes to the... Um, the notion of how what we thought we knew is challenged by a later generation. The conventional wisdom was, and still is, that James Madison was a great political scientist, that he deserves our uh, approbation, uh, whether or not he was the father of the Constitution, he was uh, the midwife, at least, to the Constitution. Um, and, uh, uh, and, and uh, you know, very important figure, but almost too cerebral, too theoretical, too professorial to be a successful wartime president. And people look at the humiliation of having Washington, D.C. burned to the ground, you know, and, and, and the president's somewhat less than heroic role in all of that. I mean, he left Dolly at the White House to, uh, you know, cut off George Washington's portrait, or he went off in search of an American army that nobody really knew where it was, um, which meant it didn't pose much of a threat to the British invaders. So um, if you look at it just that way, um, and he paid a real price. I mean, he was, uh, uh, he was such a fiscal conservative, following in Jefferson's footsteps, that he had really gutted the American military establishment, which wasn't very formidable to begin with. And in fact, it got to the point where he actually had to, in effect, subcontract the naval war out to privateers. It'd be as if um, a modern president um, subcontracted um, the war in Afghanistan to uh, Bill Gates or Warren Buffett. So for all of those reasons, Madison tends to get written off, except, okay, just as the 60s and the Civil Rights Revolution made us look at presidents like Grant in a whole new light, so recent, I would even say current events, the debate over civil liberties in wartime, which has obviously heated up in recent years during the War on Terror, um, all of a sudden people are looking at James Madison, again, the same information, but they're seeing him in a different light. All of a sudden, he's the constitutional wartime president. Nobody went to jail for criticizing his wartime leadership. There was no Alien and Sedition Acts, as under Adams and Woodrow Wilson. Um, sure, we suffered the humiliation of having the Capitol burned, but in the end, his diplomats negotiated a, a, a pretty good deal. Um, put to 
to an end for all time, the, any, any uncertainty about American independence, American sovereignty. So um, it, 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 just, it just illustrates how unfinal final judgments are. And when, when, whenever anyone tells you with great conviction that you know this is the fixed and final assessment on, it, on anything, but certainly on presidential performance, all you need to do is point to Madison or Grant. Mm -hmm. And I want to come back to that later this evening, but I want to, uh, we are going to talk about, focus a little bit tonight on the Mount Rushmore presidents as yeah. examples of success. So what common characteristics do they have that made them successful? Because we have to assume that they all belong on Mount Rushmore, which I think, I, you know, you, you could debate. Um, T.R. is there because Guts and Borglum, the sculptor, was a, a love T.R. Um, Borglum was a bull moose when the bull moose campaign in 1912. Okay. So I mean, that was his political. You know, he wasn't going to put Andrew Jackson on Mount Rushmore. Another sculptor might have you know, swa swapped them out. So any event. Um, but let's assume the four belong. Um, and I think you can make a pretty good case that they do. Well, they were all politicians. They were all very gifted politicians, including George Washington. Um, there's a, there's a wonderful scene um, at Yorktown where the battle has been won, and, and uh, you can imagine the celebratory mood among the Continental Army. Um, I'm sure they pinched themselves collectively to believe that after eight long years, um, six long years of fighting, that they had um, managed to uh, defeat the, the, the f most formidable army in the world. Anyway, uh, uh, they were all lined up for the surrender ceremony. And you can imagine there was cheering in the American ranks and uh, its opposite in the British. And at, at a dramatic moment, Washington had a great sense of theater. He understood the theater of politics. He was a great theater goer. He loved the theater. And he, he, he clearly uh, learned from what he saw. But anyway. He appeared on his great white charger and, and rode up and down the lines, basically hushing everyone. And he said, posterity will huzzah for us. <laughs> well, that tells you a couple things. First of all, it's a, it's a hell of an act. I mean, you know, <laughs> tough to follow. Um, it was absolutely perfect for the, for the moment. But it also said that he was thinking about something called posterity. And that's something, too, that I think you could say all for. When Teddy Roosevelt embarked upon his conservation crusade, you know, he was thinking a thousand years into the future. He was thinking about what happens when this already booming industrial country, greedy for natural resources, um, what happens if it is not restrained? What, what, what happens to our obligations to our, our children and grandchildren and, and beyond. And um, the fact that he was also a great politician reinforced it. But I mean, that sense of, of posterity, Jefferson buying Louisiana, that was all about, Jefferson thought, by the way, that it would take 300 years <coughs> to fill up the American continent. Now, you have to remember, when Jefferson bought Louisiana, the national population was between five and six million, and basically, you know, spread along the eastern seaboard, east of the Appalachians. But Jefferson was a visionary. Um, visionaries, to some people, that's a pejorative, because it it seems like, well, T.R. was a visionary. I, I said the other day, if you go to Oyster Bay and you visit his gravesite, appropriately next to his tombstone. There's a, a boulder inscribed with what might have been his motto as president. He said, you know, keep your feet on the ground and your eyes on the stars. That's a pragmatic visionary, if that's not an oxymoron. Um, but pragmatic visionaries, um, I won't say they all succeed, but they, they are better positioned. Uh, and I think all of those, all of those people are on Mount Rushmore. And then Lincoln is Lincoln. 
Lincoln is the president against, I think, all others are measured. Um, not least of all, because of the improbability of his story. Um, you, people overlook, it's very easy to overlook, when Lincoln became president at a time when clearly uh, war was a, a real possibility, Lincoln's entire military career consisted of about 66 days in the, uh, with the militia in the Black Hawk War in Illinois, which was a sort of serial comic episode along the frontier. Uh, and needless to say, he, neither he nor the American forces uh, covered themselves with glory. That was it. He took out books from the Library of Congress on military strategy uh, in a very earnest attempt to educate himself. And obviously, you know, there wasn't a lot of time. Um, no president has ever had more intense on-the-job training than Lincoln. And the fact that he pulled it off gives hope for the future. And I think that's another reason why he belongs on Mount Rushmore and why, look, you know, Gerald Ford famously said, I'm a Ford, not a Lincoln. Um, and he would certainly, and he would stick by that if he were here tonight. But he, in his own way, was someone who was thrust into this office with no preparation. He couldn't even acknowledge in private that he might become president for fear that it would leak and he would be seen to be undermining the man who made him vice president. He had to walk a terribly slippery tightrope for a year or so. On the one hand, reassuring the country of his belief in the president's innocence. And on the other hand, not going so far in defending Nixon as to risk losing his own integrity and whatever credibility he had if he were to become president. I mean, it's, you know, plus the month before <laughs> Ford became president, the inflation rate that month was over 5%. I mean, <laughs> stretch that out over a year, there'd be 60% inflation. I mean, we, we tend to forget because understandably we're so focused on the the, the crisis of Watergate and the, and the crisis of the legitimacy of the presidency. And, you know, Ford is seen, um, certainly by admirers, as a man who healed the country, who, you know, sort of guided us through this storm. We tend to overlook the fact that he had the very same, and in some cases, in extreme uh, form, he had the same challenges that any president with the mandate of the people um, at the polling places has. He had uh, a recession that was staring in the face, and he had something that no one had experienced before called stagflation. The idea that the economy could, could have uh, runaway prices and unemployment at the same time. That just didn't make sense um, with conventional economic theory. He had, obviously, the very unpleasant business of winding up American involvement in Southeast Asia. Um, I, you know, any, anywhere you looked, there were challenges that even if he had been, you know, had taken office under totally different, plus he had, let's face it, the dead weight of Richard Nixon to carry around. He had basically, either way, it was damned if he did and damned if he didn't. If he didn't pardon Nixon, the special prosecutor's office was telling him, and I, I, you know I'm working on a biography of Ford now, and I've seen a lot of material that has just been opened. Uh, the fact is, he was being told that it would be two years before Nixon could be brought to trial, assuming that Nixon could get a fair trial. Two years. Well, guess what? Two years, that was about as long as Ford had until the next election. 
And so in other words, he, he had a choice. Uh, he could spend the next two years in a country obsessed with Richard Nixon, um, Nixon's fate, Nixon's papers, Nixon's legal standing, all of that, or he could bite the bullet uh, and take a very unpopular action and in effect wipe his desk clean so that he could confront the problems that the American people wanted their president to be dealing with. Um, and, that, and, and I'm not saying he belongs in Mount Rushmore, but I'm saying that's the kind of, when I talked about the, the other day, the presidency as a reactive office. Um, you know, obviously that was a unique circumstance. But no one seeking the office then would have uh, welcomed uh, the opportunity to be in Ford's shoes. One other quality, by the way, that is, is, is elusive, but you know it when you can see it. Remember Justice Potter Stewart always said, you know, I, I, I may not be able to define pornography, but I know it when I see it. Um, well, in a very different sense, there's quality what I call being grounded. And there are, again, lots of ways. Um, each of you would have your own definition. But certainly the fact that the Fords were um, as deeply committed to their faith, uh, and indeed most presidents to varying degrees have been, and find it all the more solace in times of, in times of crisis. The morning of the pardon, it was a Sunday, September 8, 1974, and of course it, it took everyone like a thunderclap, which was the point. There were only three people who knew about it beforehand. Because, because if, if it had leaked, if anyone you know, there are people who will tell you now, well, you know, Ford should have prepared the country. You know, he should have said he was thinking about this and, and then weighed the reaction and so on and so on. The problem is, I, I don't know how many of you remember what things were like in 1974, but uh, the political climate was so supercharged, I argue, that, you know, to talk, you, you couldn't talk loosely about, you know, you could talk about while I'm thinking about cutting taxes or I'm thinking about even sending troops. But the, the first mention, well, yeah, I'm thinking about pardoning Nixon. That trial balloon would have been shot down before it ever reached the trees. And so Ford carried this secret with him. And that morning, before he announced the pardon, he did something very characteristic. He went to church early. There are very few people at St. John's Church. You may know it's across from the White House, the Church of the Presidents. Every president since James Madison has worshiped there. Um, FDR, before each of his inaugural, always had a prayer service at St. John's. So and anyway, Ford and Ford often attended services there. And he went and he took communion. And it was his way of, in effect, I guess, maybe finding whatever reassurance he could. By the way, I have to tell you a very quick story, which just came to me today. It's a wonderful story. While he was president, he would he usually attended services at St. John's, and uh, the layman would often read, you know, one of the gospels or one of the one of the scriptural uh, readings as part of the service. And forgive me, I'm not biblically literate enough to remember exactly. Um, where, but uh, he was handed the um, the day's reading, and it, and it and some of you might know what I'm talking about, and it, and it talked about women being obedient to men. And Ford said, I'm not reading that. <laughs> <laughs> and the rector, I mean, you don't, you don't scramble the Episcopal church service. I mean, you, you, you know, there's a reason why you know, you do this, and you do this, and you do this. Uh, but Ford, who could be very stubborn, said, I'm not reading this, <coughs> you know? Now, he didn't say Betty would kill me. He just, <laughs> he, he, you know, he didn't have to, you know? So he, he, read, uh, he read from Proverbs instead. But, I mean, you know, that's an example of being grounded. Mm -hmm. and, 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 our, and all successful presidents, Harry Truman, 
certainly. Dwight Eisenhower, certainly. Um, you know, certainly the, the everyone on, you know, none of those faces on Mount Rushmore belong to someone who was paralyzed with doubt or consumed with uncertainty. Um, you know, they were grounded and they were politically gifted. And that alone won't, won't assure success, but without those traits, I can pretty much guarantee you failure. Okay. You mentioned uh, Jefferson and uh, Louisiana Purchase, uh, Lincoln and the Civil War. You mentioned TR and conservation. What, if you had to point to one or two accomplishments of Washington's presidency, yeah. what would you point to? Well, it's interesting. I mean, there is the overall that he lent his prestige. His, he legitimated the office and indeed the experiment because that's what the United States was in 1789. Um, but in terms of specifics, um, there's nothing in the Constitution about a cabinet. Washington invented the cabinet um, as a kind of privy council people who, whose expertise he could, you know, partly to administer departments. There weren't many then. It was a small gathering, four or four in the cabinet. But, but, but also to be a kind of, you know, presidential advisory board, if you will. And then, having done that, very shrewdly, this goes to his political skill. He had, what a cabinet. He had Hamilton and Jefferson who, you know, despised one another, disagreed profoundly about big issues. I mean, uh, there was nothing petty about their feud. I mean, they hated each other for the right reasons. Um, Jefferson thought that Hamilton wanted to import English monarchy and certainly uh, uh, centralize all power with the rich and well-born. Never mind, he lived in a mountaintop mansion built by slaves, um, Jefferson found ways to consolidate a national debt in ways that, that would make the states loyal to and in fact dependent on the central government, um, who was a, you know, a volcano spewing forth ideas, most of which involved government, a bigger, more imaginative government uh, supporting elements of the private sector, uh, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And of course, all of this was anathema to Jefferson, who, uh, who personified the farmer, uh, who Jefferson believed was, you know, God's chosen people. So you had, you had the makings of a rift that could become much more than, a, than personal antagonism. I mean, Hamilton and Jefferson represented North and South, commercial versus agricultural interests. I mean, you know, it, in the hands of someone else, their disagreement, quite frankly, reflected in Congress, uh, could very well have led to the, the breakup of this very fragile, experimental nation. But Washington was skillful enough, first of all, he could have come down hard on either one of them. But the last thing in the world he wanted to do was to drive them out of the cabinet. In the immortal words of Lyndon Johnson, uh, referring to J. Edgar Hoover, I'd rather have him inside the tent pissing out than outside the tent pissing in. <laughs> Forgive me, that's Lyndon Johnson. And, and, but, but, it was, but the same situation, except instead of J. Edgar Hoover, it was Thomas Jefferson and Alexander Hamilton. And, and Washington saw both as architects of American nationhood. And he, he and he alone, I think, had the prestige and, in a curious way, the modesty. I mean, as I say, he could have come down hard, but instead he allowed, he stepped back, he allowed himself to be attacked in print by Jefferson's newspaper day after day after day. Jefferson hired supposedly a translator at the State Department, but basically working off of a government salary, he gave him time to put out this newspaper, which was denouncing the Washington administration. 
uh, the president canceled his subscription, and the editor <laughs> personally saw to it that three copies a day were delivered to the executive mansion. <laughs> um, so you know, fake news is an old, an old phenomenon uh, in America. Washington had, you see, these are not colorful qualities. These are not quotable qualities. He had patience. He had judgment. He could be oddly self-effacing. He was, you want to know Washington's real sacrifice? It's, it's in the last years of his life when he would rather be anywhere than in the cockpit of political contention. He jealously guarded his reputation, and he realized that he was risking his reputation by becoming president, that if this thing failed, and the odds were certainly against his success. So, you know, Washington is, I think, in many ways, the greatest president. But he's not, th things that a modern audience have been trained to spot as presidential leadership are more obvious. You know, Washington would not have shown in an Oval Office address. Um, Washington, in fact, is admiring Washington uh, when told that Washington intended to leave voluntarily. Said, if that's true, then he's the greatest man in the world. The, it's something what Washington did. Washington prevented the presidency from growing into a potentially monarchical or even dictatorial office. His prestige was so immense that it took 100, almost 150 years before a president could even talk about a third term. And even then, only under the unique circumstances of the, of the war in Europe and, and the threat that it posed to, to America. So Washington, by the, 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 by the character, by his political skills, his, his, his gift for leadership, his vision, he, he didn't have much of a sense of humor. The founders were not a laugh riot. Um, Jefferson, who was a great man in many ways, uh, has no sense of humor at all. He has a sense of mathematics. Um, he's very cerebral. Um, when, a, when his closest friend died, when they were very young, um, they had made a, a pact. Whoever died first would bury the other on Jefferson's mountain. This was even before he built Monticello. But, you know, the, anyway. And Jefferson's reaction, which is utterly typical, um, was to conduct a dialogue with himself about mathematics. And if you dug so many, you know, shovels of earth, uh, you know, in an hour, how many could you do in a day? And how long would it take to clear a graveyard of, the, it was just, you know, it, it's an odd mind. Um, I, the older I get, the more um, perplexed I am about Jefferson. And, and the more I'm inclined to think of him as, forgive me, uh, something of a political phony. Um, he hated confrontation, and that's fine. So in lieu of confronting people honestly with their disagreements, he worked behind the scenes, pulled strings, employed agents, um, and sometimes lied. I mean, some of his correspondence after he left the cabinet about Washington, unfortunately, leaked. There were leaks then, too. And, and he had some very unflattering things to say. And it really, unfortunately, it destroyed uh, the relationship. But um, it, there's a reason why people go on writing books about Jefferson, because he is so complicated and so elusive, and every generation rediscovers something good and something not so good. Mm -hmm. Now, in, uh, in 2011, and some of you folks may remember, uh, you had this idea for a lecture series that I think is my favorite in my entire <laughs> tenure here, and that was the idea of a 20th century Mount Rushmore. Oh, yeah. And you put 
four presidents on the 20th century Mount Rushmore, Wilson, uh, FDR, Eisenhower, and Reagan. Right. Two Were Republicans, those, two Democrats. And one um, Kansan. And I left off Harry Truman, for which I caught hell, which is, I guess, <laughs> I guess only appropriate. You know, they gave me hell, I guess. Yeah. Um, but you could, you could certainly put Truman. And uh, most people would not put Wilson. That's, that's an idiosyncrasy on my part. Um, Teddy, Teddy is already there. That's why I didn't mention Teddy Roosevelt. Um, but I, th I yeah, I, I understand why those. I, say, I, I certainly understand putting, if you wanted to replace Wilson with Truman. Yeah. By the way, Truman was a great admirer of Wilson. Uh, Truman, of course, had fought in World War I, and he looked upon Wilson as his, as his president. Do you think, by and large, that those four presidents were successful for the same reasons that yeah, the uh, original Mount Rushmore presidents were? Well, uh, yeah, uh, under very different circumstances right. and, and with, with bigger caveats. I mean, certainly in the case of Wilson, as I talked about the other day, it's certainly not a record of unblemished success. It's a record very blemished, and I, and I suspect most people would not put Wilson on Mount Rushmore. Um, and again, modern, the modern Americans look at Wilson and they see his, uh, his southern roots and his, uh, his racism. His, there's no other word for it. Um, and, they, and they have trouble understanding how, how a, a champion of self-determination on the global stage could wear blinkers, in effect, you know, at home. Um, there are certainly people who will look at Truman. I mean, Truman is still, in some quarters, a controversial figure. There are some people on the left who've never forgiven him for dropping the bomb, and they think that Truman started the Cold War, which I would take issue with. But, but any event, but there's that school of thought. Uh, and there are other people who think that, you know, we, we've tended the, the folkloric Truman, you know, give him hell Harry. James Whitmore on stage, all of that has, has crowded out. There's a reason why, you know, during his presidency, it was said that to air was Truman. Um, look at the first couple of years, and again, it's always difficult after a war, the, the whole process of, of, of trying to, you know, bring people back home, uh, a dislocated economy. I mean, all of those factors come into play. Um, but, you know, Truman didn't handle them very well. And also, he didn't do a very good job of explaining the Korean War. I mean, one reason why he had low poll numbers when he left office was it wasn't that people thought we were losing in Korea. It wasn't even particularly they thought we shouldn't be there. But, you know, they were, they were accustomed to Franklin Roosevelt interpreting events and justifying policies. And no one expected Truman to, to sound like Roosevelt. But, but again, people have been conditioned to, to think of, you know, there's a whole generation for whom Franklin Roosevelt was not just the president, but he was the presidency. And, and, and Truman was about stylistically as different as you could be. Well, in the long run, history has recorded both of them very high marks, but you know, and there's certainly still people who think that Eisenhower should have been much more aggressive, proactive on civil rights. They, they think that he should have uh, likewise taken the lead with Joe McCarthy. I think Eisenhower was very shrewd. Eisenhower's view was, he, well, he's, he said, you know, I don't want to get into a mud with that uh, skunk. Uh, and by that he meant what McCarthy wanted was attention. And if you could get the President of the United States' attention, if you could turn this into McCarthy versus the President of the United States, I mean, that would fuel McCarthy's ego and, and perhaps his, his crusade, such as it was. And Ike understood it was like cutting off oxygen if he ignored him. But he made sure behind the, scr the scenes that all sorts of other people were not ignoring him, in the Army especially. And he was confident enough, again, see, it's odd to speak of presidential modesty, but great presidents, 
can be, in their own self-interest, by the way, as well as the national interest, uh, they don't need to see themselves, I mean, the whole idea of hidden hand leadership. You know, the, the wonderful story I've told before about Eisenhower. Put, I mean, put it in perspective. After he left office, he was invited to the University of Pennsylvania, where his brother Milton was president, uh, to speak to the commencement. And it was outdoors in June. The weather was threatening. And they were making small talk while waiting to go out on stage. And someone said, oh, you know, Milton, do you think the weather is going to hold? And Milton said to his brother, you know, repeated this, you, you, you worried about, the, about rain. And Eisenhower said, Milton, I haven't worried about the weather since June 6, 1944. <laughs> <laughs> that puts it all in perspective. I mean, it's not in some ways a modest remark, but it's modestly delivered. And, and it tells you, for Dwight, like George Washington, for Dwight Eisenhower becoming president was almost a step down. And so, and Ike, again, his vision, his sense of what was good for the country over the long haul uh, required that he step back and wait for McCarthy to destroy himself. Because he was utterly convinced that McCarthy would, if you give him enough rope, hang himself. And that's, that's pretty much what happened. And, and, act, and afterward, though, he did, I don't know if it was ungracious or not, afterward he allowed himself a victory lap. He said, McCarthyism is now McCarthy wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> and I have to add what I consider one of the finest quotes about the dispute between the two men was uh, a conservative intellectual Russell Kirk who famously said, Eisenhower isn't a communist, Eisenhower is a golfer. But, but you see, and, but that, that th and the thing was, Ike was content. Some of the presidents I can think of would probably tweet uh, vehement objections to any such characterization. I can't imagine who you're I thinking know, of, I know, I don't know. You know, it's just, I'm reaching, I think, Franklin Pierce. Um, <laughs> but Ike, again, Ike, A, he was self-confident enough, B, he was self-effacing enough. And see, he knew it was in his, as well as the country's, interest not, you know, not to engage. He had, he had, he had a profound sense of dignity. And, and again, dignity is something that, you know, there's no constitutional mandate. But if you think of the four, including Teddy Roosevelt, TR, you know, they restored the White House. If you go to the White House today, it's not Jackie Kennedy's White House that you see. It's Theodore Roosevelt's and Edith Roosevelt. They took this house, which was, of course, drowning in Victorian stained glass and potted palms and horrible overstuffed furniture, um, and they cleared it all out. Um, and, um, and they took it back to the federal period. George Washington never saw the White House. But he could have walked into Theodore Roosevelt's White House and felt perfectly at home. I, this kind of severe Republican with a small r dignity. And, and people who, who, who were around him, I mean, we all think of the rambunctious TR, you know, having pillow fights with his children. And I mean, being, you know, Edith said, you must remember, uh, you know, I have six children of whom Theodore is the youngest, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and, 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 and that's true, you know. That's the popular TR. But there was a, another side he had a, nobody called him Teddy who knew him. On the one hand, he was perfectly willing to exploit that public image. He knew, he knew that was a great vote getting, you know. So there's that, that not cynical, but you know, the worldly um, adept politician. But on the other hand, people who knew him uh, addressed him as Mr. President or Theodore, including his wife. Okay, I have one question uh, remaining, and then I'm going to open it up to questions from the audience. So be thinking about what questions that you may want to pose to uh, Richard tonight. But Sunday, Richard, we talked about Grant, and we talked about a rather significant move up the rankings that Grant had made 
between two of the C-SPAN polls, I think uh, uh, the most recent and the previous. I'm curious, if you had to pick one or two presidents who you thought might pop higher, you know, in the next ranking or in a future ranking, is there anybody you would point out to us tonight? Hmm, good question. Um, it's easier to, to, to look at presidents who I think might slip. Um, I, I think Andrew Jackson is um, unnaturally depressed right now. I mean, if you think of him as fifth, in 15th or 18th place, that's, that's you know, I think that's a, a phase we're going through. Um, and I think Jackson will, in time, I, I, he may never get back to 7th or 8th, but, but I, I, I make a prediction. Um, there is a school of thought that McKinley uh, deserves, and I mean, and he has in fact been creeping up, but um, uh, there's a wonderful new biography, by the way, uh, by Bob Mary, highly recommend it. Um, but McKinley was, not Teddy Roosevelt, McKinley was our first modern president. It was McKinley who broke the back of the, the depression that Grover Cleveland dealt with. It was McKinley who preserved the gold standard. It was McKinley who against, in some ways, his better wishes, took us to war with Spain and who acquired an empire. For better or worse, uh, the notion of America as an imperial power, a global power, uh, extending beyond the continent, that's McKinley. He annexed Hawaii, something that Cleveland didn't want to do. And uh, there was a great debate at the turn of the century uh, between those who agreed with McKinley and T.R that the United States had, uh, you know, its place in the sun, that it, it, that it needed, it needed a, a, a navy, for example, in two oceans, uh, that it needed commercial uh, activities around the globe, uh, you know, on and on and on. The, the modern architects of modernity. A and I would argue, plus McKinley, who had been, of course, a great protectionist, the McKinley Terror, uh, which was designed to keep out foreign goods even if it jacked up prices, you know, for working families. By the end of his life, the last speech he ever gave at the Buffalo Exposition, McKinley, in effect, recanted. And he talked about now America is a world power, which means, in effect, that we need to lower the trade barriers. We need to reach out and establish trading partnerships. I mean, McKinley, McKinley, uh, some would say, grow. He certainly had evolved. Um, and uh, so I think he's, he's, he's probably the best president you've never heard of or know, know nothing about. OK, very good. Uh, we'll open it up to questions from the audience. Uh, get Clara's attention or Alex. They'll bring a microphone by. And uh, you may pose your question to Richard. Just raise your hand if you have a question. Yeah, um, in the last few elections, presidential elections, there's concern about uh, nominations for the Supreme Court and the, uh, the other uh, federal uh, courts also. Uh, how does that play into the rankings? That's a very good question. And of course, as you might imagine, some, depending on who's doing the ranking, uh, that, that in fact might be a very specific and, and prominent, it's certainly a very legitimate um, factor to take into consideration. The, the problem in some ways with, with, the, with the question is, um, if you're a liberal or a conservative, broadly defined, you know, you, how, how you think the court should, could, should rule is, is probably going to dictate uh, how you think the president performed. Um, Woodrow Wilson, I think one of the great pluses for Wilson is that he put Louis Brandeis, the first Jew, on the Supreme Court at a time when uh, the best people, including the president of Harvard and many others, signed uh, public petitions of protest, ostensibly because they didn't like Brandeis's politics, but clearly it was tinged with uh, anti-Semitism. So, so Wilson gets, I think, points. First of all, I think Brandeis was a great justice, but he gets points for being willing to break that barrier, just as I think Ronald Reagan gets points for putting the first woman on the Supreme Court. Uh, so that's one way 
uh, a kind of a non-ideological way to approach the, the significance of the judiciary. Um, Harry Truman, it's generally conceded, put the weakest slate of justices. I mean, Chief Justice Fred Vinson is not a name that lives on in the ages. Sherman Minton, I mean, uh, you know, enough said. Tom Clark, I mean, th these are not impressive uh, shapers of, of the judicial legacy. Um, and it's, it's that side of Truman, with all due respect, you know, who liked to surround himself with cronies. I mean, people who were not always necessarily people you want to have, you know, at the, at the president's side. They weren't venal, they weren't evil, they were just mediocre. And, you know, there is the, the famous Roman Ruska, Republican senator from uh, Nebraska, who, who immortalized himself when President Nixon appointed G. Harold Kurzweil to, uh, to the court. And having failed with Clement Hainsworth, who actually should have been confirmed. But in retrospect, nobody thinks Bob Dole. Uh, it's funny, we had a conversation. Who, and of course, Dole carried water for the White House for both nominees. He said, you know, Carswell never should have been nominated. But the brilliant thing, the, it was tough to make a case. Uh, but the, the case against Carswell, I mean, he'd never done anything distinguished. Um, Pat Buchanan once told me in an interview, he said when they nominated, he called him up and said, okay, uh, Judge, you know, are there uh, some decisions that you're particularly proud of? No. Uh, well, are there, you know, articles you've written, law review? No, I've done that. Um, and he went through this list of sort of the obvious things if you were putting together a portfolio and came up with a goose egg. Um, but it was left to Senator Ruska to sum up brilliantly, unintentionally, uh, the case for G. Harold Carswell because the word that stuck to him in the media was mediocre. He was mediocre. And, and Senator Ruska said, well, you know, even mediocre people need representation on the Supreme Court. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I guess mathematically you can make the case. He said, you know, lots of people are mediocre, um, including perhaps the senator from Nebraska. But, um, <laughs> but anyway, that was, um, it, it was not a winning argument. And G. Harold Carswell subsequently retired from the bench, ran for the Senate, lost the Republican primary, and then, rather tragically, uh, was involved in a unfortunate personal scandal. So, um, probably just as well that he never, never got it, got to the bench. Okay. Do we have? Oh, we have a question back here. <clears throat> it seems like there's a a trend, particularly in the last couple of years, to uh, not only have revisionism of of our. Um, our presidents, but putting them under lenses that we think is the current standard of morality, such as those like Jefferson having slaves and Woodrow Wilson and his racist right. views. Yeah. And are you concerned and in, in how it's can this be countered that only contemporary views that were to, to view and judge our presidents under those lenses? Um, I'm going to give you a double-barreled answer because, because it's a, it's a double-barreled question. Um, you're entitled to any opinion you want to have about a president, and you can use any criteria, uh, it seems to me, you want, um, including contemporary mores and conventions. On the other hand, if you're judging a president, which is different from opining, in effect, your feelings about a president. If you are, uh, particularly in a, a serious, thoughtful, scholarly way, trying to assess a president's performance or any other historical figure, it seems to me you can only do so within the context of his times. A and that means um, 
elements that today we find repugnant. I'm not saying you accept them, much less endorse them, but you have to understand every generation, including our own, I can guarantee you 100 years from now, if we're still around as a species, um, and the waters have a totally inundated Kansas, um, if we're still around, I can guarantee, the one thing I can guarantee you is there will be people in, in positions like this, uh, having conversations like this, shaking their head in, in, in wonderment at what you know, people in 2018 took for granted. That is the best proof positive that America is a dynamic experiment. Uh, as I say, a country that's always in the process of becoming. Um, hopefully we never reach the day when we've become. Um, and, and so I think you have the luxury of, of, of assessing a president any way you want. But if you're, if you're judging a president's performance, then uh, you have to understand the limits, the conventions, um, you know, the atmosphere he breathed, the political boundaries, the consensus of the day, social and political. Um, we should not ever make the mistake uh, that we too often make of, of thinking of our presidents as some kind of superhuman, someone larger than the times in which they operate. The fact is, every single president has been, in effect, not a slave to, but, but, but limited by the consensus that he found, the political consensus that he found. Now, a handful of presidents, the, transition, the, the, uh, the transformative presidents, and I would say in the, in the last century, FDR, uh, Ed Reagan are the two most obvious examples. Their historical stature, whatever you think of their individual programs, their historical stature is assured because they almost uniquely possessed the ability and maybe the luck, timing has a lot to do with it, to actually move those mountains. In other words, the Roosevelt Consensus that held in this country for 50 years regarding the role of the federal government, yeah, particularly in the economy, um, that came under sustained assault, if you will, uh, in the 80s. And the, the fascinating thing is, have we reached the end of the age of Reagan even now? I'm not sure we have because of the continuing instinctive suspicion of government. Um, I mean, there are millions of people. 50 years ago, if you asked people, 70% of them would told you, I trust the government to do what's right. I trust the government, period. I suspect those numbers would be reversed today. And it's not just on the right, it's on the left as well. So FDR, we remember, because among other things, he transformed our expectations of Washington and the relationship between Washington and the average citizen. Uh, the debate rages on about whether the New Deal solved the Depression. That overlooks the larger issue because only part of the New Deal was about emergency relief. Um, the reason we remember Franklin Roosevelt is because he's the president who created a social safety net. Before Roosevelt, there was no social security. Before Roosevelt, no one thought of insuring bank deposits. Before Roosevelt, no one could conceive of Wall Street being regulated by Washington. I mean, and on and on. All of that was part of this sea change that took place during his presidency. And I would argue the consensus that Harry Truman confirmed in 1948 and that Dwight Eisenhower 
in some ways deferred to. Ike didn't try to turn the clock back. There are a lot of conservative Republicans who are not happy with Eisenhower. They thought, you know, you could repeal Social Security. Now we have a Republican president in Congress. Uh, Eisenhower, with I would argue a much shrewder grasp on the body politic, not only didn't repeal Social Security, he expanded it to include 10 million people, including farmers, who had not been included in the original program. All of that, but that was his political shrewdness. He understood that as a Republican, the first Republican since Herbert Hoover, he had the opportunity to make people forget Herbert Hoover, all right? And, and, the, and, the, and the cliches that attached themselves to Hoover and the Republicans as the party of hard times. And, and, by, and that's one of Ike's signal accomplishments. And uh, nobody ever acknowledges it. You know, the, uh, the other thing is, you know, it wasn't Barry Goldwater who established a Republican beachhead in the South. It was Dwight Eisenhower. And he did it without making racially repugnant appeals. He did it in, 19, in 1952. He carried a majority of southern states. And the great debate 10 years later, and I, and I write about this with the Ford book because Ford was caught up in this. Ford was the first Republican minority leader who wanted to break the old coalition between Republicans and Southern Democrats for a very simple reason. He wanted to build a separate Southern Republican Party. But he wanted a Southern Republican Party that was more Eisenhower than Goldwater and more Lincoln than anything else. That's not the way it turned out, but you know. So anyway, what the simplest thing is to say what, what Roosevelt did which was revolutionary in its time. 50 years later, no longer seemed revolutionary. It seemed orthodox. And Ronald Reagan, you know, there was a reason they called it the Reagan Revolution. The great irony is that Ronald Reagan voted for FDR four times. And he never could be persuaded. You know, Reagan thought, Reagan's thought process was not like conventional politicians. Reagan could never be prevailed upon to see what he was doing as undoing the Roosevelt Revolution. He, he thought he was following in Roosevelt's footsteps. And, and he had a case. He looked at Roosevelt and he saw a pragmatist, a man doing what he had to do under a unique set of circumstances, a grave economic crisis to basically win the battle for public opinion and to preserve American democratic with a small d capitalism. The critics of FDR today are mostly on the left. They're not on the right. And they're on the left. They criticized Roosevelt because he didn't take advantage of the Great Depression to nationalize the banks and the railroads and, and basically I introduce a, a significant element of old fashioned socialism. Well, that wasn't Roosevelt. Roosevelt was surprisingly conservative. He was orthodox in his economics. The first chance he had at the beginning of his second term, he tried to balance the budget. And what did it do? It brought on the Roosevelt recession and the huge losses in 1938. So, you know, Reagan in his own mind saw himself in following, in, in, Reagan didn't think of himself as an ideologue. And in fact, Reagan wasn't an ideologue. Reagan was a pragmatic <coughs> conservative. Remember, he'd been a union president. He was accustomed to negotiating with some pretty tough characters. And he always said, if I can get 80% of what I want, then as far as I'm concerned, that's a victory. You know, I can go back later and worry about the 20%. And I would suggest that attitude might very well serve his latter day descendants, or those who claim to be his descendants, better than the you know, line in the sand, all or nothing, shut the government down if we don't get our way approach, which you know at, at times either party has adopted. But uh, anyway. OK, we have a question here. Perhaps you 
kind of got to this. Is there precedent, and if not, what do you think happens to a presidential ranking if the successor seems bound and determined to destroy the legacy of his predecessor? Gee, you, you wouldn't have anyone in mind, would you? <laughs> Put it this way. Um, there's a reason why that is, has almost never happened. Um, quite frankly, most people, but assuming the presidency, are so aware of the enormous burden that they are taking on and of the profound challenges that confront them, they are so keenly attuned to their obligations to the American people and to posterity. And they also appreciate the fact that the presidency, contrary to what we like to think, is much more about continuity than it is about change. You know, presidents have been dealing with the Middle East for 70 years, some better, some worse. Uh, as long as you and I are alive, you know, presidents will deal with uh, economic questions, um, environmental issues. I mean, issues arise uh, that haven't been, you know, demanded his attention before. But the, the point of all this is a, a president is too busy trying to do his job, trying to learn to be president. Um, to think in terms of undoing his predecessor's legacy. Uh, I can't think of anyone, and, 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 and for example, there have been times when the pendulum has swung violently. I mean, where you would not have wanted to be in the car riding down Pennsylvania Avenue with Herbert Hoover and Franklin Roosevelt. That was not a happy day. Well, happy days were here again for, for some, but not, not, you know, that was not a pleasant excursion. Um, but, you know, to get contemporary, clearly, you know, as a rule, people are on their best behavior <laughs> on Inauguration Day. Now, someone as genial as Eisenhower was furious at Truman by, by the time Truman was furious at Eisenhower, and Eisenhower was furious at Truman, to the point where when the car pulled up to the White House for the usual, you know, they go in and have coffee, Ike refused to get out of the car. He would not go in and have coffee with Harry Truman. Because Ike took very personally the things that Truman had said about him during the campaign. Now, that's the non-politician, you know, the thin skin. Um, if it's any consolation, he said worse things about people at his own party, you know. But uh, he said worse things about Herbert Hoover, and they were, you know, and Hoover said he added 10 years to his life. I mean, they, politicians say things, you know. Okay. So, you know, I can't think of, um, or, you know, when McKinley replaced Grover Cleveland, or um, when Wilson replaced Taft, um, or when Harding replaced Wilson. Huge landslide victories, which could be interpreted as a repudiation of the outgoing administration. But, you know, aside from opposing the League of Nations, which was already dead at that point, um, Harding didn't, I mean, <laughs> Harding had trouble enough staying out of jail. Um, <laughs> And most of his cabinet, too. I mean, um, now Wilson, you know, Wilson had the great line. God, there, there were never two more dissimilar men. I mean, Trump and Obama come close. But Wilson and Harding, you know, Wilson said about Harding, at his last cabinet meeting, he said he, he had intended to show people how an ex-president should behave, which meant he was going to basically, you know, do very much what the Bushes have done. Kind of, you know, he wasn't going to attack his predecessor. He said, I must confess, however, there will be some things that are going to take some getting used to 
beginning with Mr. Harding's English. Uh, remember, Wilson was a scholar in politics. Wilson, de Wilson described Harding as having a bungalow mind, no upper story. <laughs> <laughs> and Harding, who was a kind man, give him that, you know. Um, I, I, there's no record of him saying anything unkind about Wilson. Um, but, but the fact of the matter is, what did Harding have to deal with? Harding had to deal with the same problems, post-war problems, that bedeviled the last months of the Wilson administration. So one reason why you don't find presidents trying to undo their predecessor's legacy is because it's their legacy too. They've inherited the same. Now, they may do things very differently, but that's, but that's different from what I think you're referring to. So I would, I would you know, I think um, the, as in so many ways, what we're living through is unique. Okay. We're going to take one last question. I think we have a question in the back. What president that is often overlooked do you think should be dis discussed more thoroughly in schools? That's a great question. I mean, that's first cousin to, you know, who are the most underrated uh, presidents? Well, I said we talked a little bit about Polk the other day as uh, someone who probably crammed more significant accomplishment into four years and then voluntarily left. Uh, McKinley. Um, I'll tell you uh, uh, my bias. I, um, I'm from New England and uh, I've always identified with uh, John Quincy Adams who um, had the most impressive resume in American history. You know, at 14 he was deputy ambassador in Russia. Um, he, uh, he spoke seven languages. And, and literally every morning would read a chapter of the Bible and, and his great intellectual uh, pleasure before breakfast. Well, he could read uh, Greek. He could translate Greek in one hand and Latin with the other. Now, that does not suggest a man of the people uh, necessarily, <laughs> you know? <laughs> he, oh, really? He was, at a very young age, before he was a United States Senator, he was a professor of rhetoric at Harvard, which maybe tells you all you need to know. Um, he was, like an Adams, like all Adams is, uh, he was a party of one. He didn't like political parties. He, he um, in some ways, was a throwback to the founders, uh, you know, and um, he thought he could govern without becoming a partisan figure. He gave one speech, public speech, in four years as president. So he's anything but a modern president. Every, um, every morning he used to go down to the Potomac and strip down and swim, being an Adams, invariably against the tide, um, <laughs> in, in the buff. And the story is a female reporter who had been trying without success to get a story, an interview with the president, um, showed up one day on the Riverside and basically sat on his clothes until he agreed to, uh, to give her the interview. Um, but Adams was someone who loved his country with an old-fashioned intensity. And of course, remember, in his, it's in his last years. I mean, he's defeated for re-election within a month his alcoholic son commits suicide. I mean, he's clearly, you know, inclined to, uh, I mean, all Adams is a dower, and they, they see the gloomy side of things, um, often with, with reason. And then what does he do? He's the only American president who left the White House and came back as a member of the lowly House of Representatives, and it was in the House of Representatives, where he found his voice. He became known as Old Man Eloquent, except to the Southern members who referred to him as the madman from Massachusetts. <laughs> but that's because he became the first real leading public voice of opposition to slavery. And if you've seen Spielberg's Amistad, 
you know something about uh, the lengths to which Adams would go, whatever the political risk. I mean, Ad the one thing about Adams is, is they never are, they never fear to be unpopular. In fact, they almost court unpopularity as, as evidence of their New England conscience. Um, but it was in those last years, the gag rule. Can you imagine, led by Southerners, but not exclusively Southerners, you know, the House of Representatives had voted a gag rule which said the American people, if you oppose slavery, you could not send a petition to Congress. It would not be received. Ne never mind acted on. It, you, you couldn't even petition Congress. That was the gag rule. And year after year after year, old man Eloquin stood up, sometimes alone, um, you know, a lonely voice to, to override, to get rid of the blatantly unconstitutional gag rule. And two years before he died, you know, he prevailed. And, and the great story, he, he died, talk about with his boots on, on the floor of the house. He was 81 years old. And, and, and a few desks away was a young one-term congressman from Illinois named Abraham Lincoln. And Lincoln was present when Adams turned very red in the face and collapsed with a stroke. And he was uh, taken to a room nearby, placed on a sofa. They brought Henry Clay, old Henry Clay, who'd been his Secretary of State, very close. You know, Clay in tears to say goodbye. I mean, you know, it's kind of a Hollywood scene. And two days later, he died. Supposedly, his last words were, um, tis the end of Earth, I am content. And I've always insisted that not possible because Adams was never content. <laughs> and that's the secret to John Quincy Adams. He had a restless conscience. And that might be one more qualification that you want to add to a president. Okay, Richard, thanks so much. Oh yeah, you bet. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Don't you forget, for coming. Yeah, thank you for coming. Don't forget our next two sessions on the 12th. We'll talk about presidents who were failures, who were not successful. And then on the 14th, we'll take a very narrow look at our contemporary presidents. So thank you all for coming. Hope to see you on those nights. <laughs>